Welcome, sir. Request to kindly share your. I extend the warm blessings of Amma and greetings from Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences, Faridabad. Uh, it's pretty a humbling experience to be associated with such elite panel and asked to discuss upon a topic of method verification. The question on method verification and method validation had come up some time before. Method validation is a detailed document and an extensive work on a test. It's a complete data of the R&D that has been done before a manufacturer can bring the test to the market. And these documents are thoroughly scrutinized by the accrediting agencies, involves a lot of work. I had the fortune or misfortune of having had to do a method validation for an HPLC test, which I started off in my lab, six months of hell. Fortunately, method verification is not, not so tough. All that we are going to do over here is we are expected to verify whether the toll claims made by the manufacturers on the performance of the test is true or not. When a manufacturer brings a kit to the market, he's got a lot of details about it, including what are the linearity of the test, what is the sensitivity and specificity of the test, and what is the interferences that have happened on the test, and what is the biological reference intervals and all that stuff. We are just going to verify whether all those claims are true in our context. Now, we have to be very clear in our mind as to why are we doing a method verification. And whether people accept it or not, most of the driving forces, it is mandated by the NABL. So if I have to start a new test, I have to do a method verification. And if you're doing that, we are working with a fear complex. The true reason why we should be doing a method verification is it should be answering the curiosity of you about the test. I am introducing a new test in this lab. Is this test actually measuring what I want to measure? Can I confidently sign this report and issue it with a thorough knowledge that this report will be used for clinical management of a patient? So if that is my question and that is my curiosity, I will do a set of tests to ensure that I am confident about reporting on this results. So the aim for doing a method verification would should be to answer your curiosity. And when it's driven by this question, it will be done properly. And what is implied is it will be done correctly and it will be ready for audit. So if you answer this question to yourself, not only will you be confident of signing the report, you will also be audit ready. So this is a better approach of doing it. The next question comes, how do we do it? Just like all my previous speakers have also talked about, and I would also quote a CLSI guidelines, this document is available and very extensive and exhaustive and what all we are supposed to do it. Has anyone seen this? No, it's pretty expensive. If you have the fortune or misfortune of reading this document, it is so ex extensive with so much of technical jargon into it that probably would require a lawyer to interpret it for you. So net result is when people say refer to CLSI guidelines, I personally believe that it is something like somebody saying, come and meet me in my office when I'm not there and I'll solve your problem. I'll also take this opportunity to address this elite gathering because I know that a lot of my seniors and a lot of um, people who have been in the field of quality for a long time, the requirement of the R for today is rather than saying refer to CLSI guidelines because none of us are having access to it. It is imperative that we make job cards for all lab processes, which is kept in public domain, which all the lab people can refer to and use that as an authority. So if I have a clear text that says a process should be done like A, B, C, D, and it is in public domain, everyone will do it and do it properly. So it needs to come into the public domain. Maybe it could be an Indianized standard. That is the requirement of the R, and we all should work on it. This is a small request from my side. I also got across this line from Dr. Harbhan Shrayabachan 
ऑन हिज फेवरेस्ट पोएट्री मधुशाला अलग अलग पद बतलाते सब पर मैं ये बतलाता हूं राह पकड़ तू एक चला चल पा जाएगा मधुशाला सो इफ यू वेरी क्लियर एज टू हाउ यू गोइंग टू एंड अप एंड यू आर वेरी कॉन्फिडेंट अबाउट इट वर्क ऑन इट हार्ड एंड यू विल रीच योर डेस्टिनेशन this is the era of chat gpt and before making this presentation i just tried to test myself and say okay chat gpt tell me what are the steps of method verification in a clinical laboratory and this is the document which i have got it clearly defines what are all the steps to be done define the performance characteristics of the method select an appropriate reference material establish acceptance criteria perform the method verification grill upon it it will tell you how to do it properly analyze the results document the results and monitor the methods so all these are available in chat gpt the most important question in this is establishment of acceptance criteria so then i got a bit more lucky and i asked chat gpt freely what is the acceptance criteria for what is the cv percentage for alt and this is what i got with certain references but if you are a purist and you want to do it the real hard way you have the westgard site you can go to the clia and quality uh, quality tab and choose cli requirements for analytical quality and you'll get a table with all the percentages specified what to be more stringent go to the biological validation database this is also in the westgard site and it throws you a whole lot of numbers and good luck if you understand what these numbers mean or how to use them what people generally rely is i have to start a new test get the test do the validation processes or the verification processes get the data and then redefine your acceptance criteria that is mexican target and that is definitely something that i do not recommend when you going to do a method verification the first thing is start with an sop you should be very clear as to when i go for a method verification what all am i going to do we have to be clear as to what steps need to be done who needs to do it and what is the acceptance criteria you should ask the technician handling the test are you clear of what you are doing we have to be very clear and specific in our instructions that after you have done the test give me the hard copies because the hard copies are going to be documented whatever result you get is correct don't adjust results to suit your requirement have faith that your system is good if it fail as i said it is important to define your acceptance criteria way before and then start doing the test don't do it the other way around or do the test and redefine the cv criteria now how do you get the cv percentage for acceptance as we said the clsi guidelines bv chat gpt but a more practical approach although this may not be written theoretically and i can be challenged about it but personally i feel that this works ask your neighbor labs which are running the same test on the same platform as to what is the cv percentage that we are getting you should be able to get that or better than that okay and no need just to mention that that ought to be an abl lab you're not going to ask any xyz lab you pick a quality lab which is running the test in the platform which you intend to run the test see what their cv percentage is either get that or get something better than that the question that comes is if you don't have a peer then what are you going to do and the next question comes if you don't have a peer do you really need to introduce that test unless it's got to be some of those unique tests and you're a unique lab in which case you fall back to the clsi and the bb so what are all the tests that we need to do we need to do studies to check the precision the accuracy the linearity or the amr the biological reference intervals carry over studies test stability and there are special situations like edestroponin which i will cover how do we go about doing it we can use both controls 
and patient sample. There are certain things where we have to use the patient sample, like when you're taking the accuracy of a result, when you're checking the biological reference intervals, when you are doing a storage sample testing and all, you can use a patient sample. But when you're doing precision studies, like you're doing an intra-run precision or an inter-run precision, can you, you should use the control methods. Control levels can use two or three control levels, preferably use controls at decision points, preferably use controls which test the system's efficacy. So the first test we do is establishing an intra-run precision study. Uh, the debate on how many runs and uh, we've had a lot of values and the common answers that everybody says is specify it in your documents, in your SOPs. If it is a running routine vocabulary test, 20 points are good. If the test is pretty expensive, you can reduce it to 10. If the tests are very rare, possibly five also, whatever it is, this is a trade-off that you will do because the point we are making over here is, is this being driven by showing documents to an auditor or is this being done to satisfy your curiosity? By and large, for most of the conventional parameters, 20 runs, define the CV. After you've got the 20 runs, calculate the mean standard deviation in CV. If the mean standard deviation CV is less than that of the criteria which you have set, very good. Raw data is a must because when you are going to present your documents to an auditor, if at all, you need to know that those tests were done and you have proper documentary tales, printouts from the analyzers saying that these tests were run on this date around the same time, which is very important. The audit trail that the timing of all the tests, it is just intra run. So all the tests should have been done in the same run. So the timings of the results should also be close to each other. Those are the points which would be looked for. Produce that, see it. Interrun, test the stability of the test over a period of time. So if you use two controls or three controls, run them in replicates of five, five in batches, eight hours apart. So usually about two to three days time it is done. Use five such runs and calculate the CV of the entire data. This is the CV of the entire data over a period of two to three days over multiple runs, right? So that data will show how robust the sample is. It's preferable to use a control here because the controls have come with some inbuilt stability. Calculate the CV over the entire duration of time. And this should be better than the CV that we have said would be the acceptance criteria. As long as we are below that CV percentage, we're doing good. If you're going above, there is a reason to be worried about. Important again, as I said, the raw data should be kept and the raw data should clearly specify that these samples were run in batches and there was a significant time difference between the running of the batches. What is that significant difference? Preferably eight hours, maybe 12 hours, maybe 24 hours, but not one hour or two hours. You need to have a decent amount of time. And typically what a lab does in order to save money because all tests is revenue wasted, the intra-run precision that we have done, 20 runs, we can use these points as our first point, right? So it saves you about five tests per control level because this was also one particular run. So we can include these values, just a practical aspect of it. Accuracy testing, yes. The results which I'm getting, are these results accurate or not? And controls will really not be helpful in testing the accuracy. Controls will be used for testing the precision. So how do we do accuracy? Ideally, the samples which I'm doing in this analyzer, I use a particular kit in a particular analyzer. I need to run the samples in an other lab, having the same equipment, same test parameter to see that my results and that lab's result match. That is the definition of accuracy. The parameter which I'm doing in my analyzer, I should do the test, get the results, send the samples to the other reference lab. Important criteria is that lab should be having the same reagent and the same equipment. They should be having a good IQC and an EQA program because if they don't have that, you cannot 
validate your quality on a lab where we don't know about the quality of the lab. And the last thing that we should be looking around, which we nobody ever looks into it is, in the previous month, was the parameter which I'm checking, was it EQA pass or not? So if the test, if the lab has got a good IQC EQA policy, if the lab has passed the EQA in the previous run, it is running the same equipment, same reagent, then comparing the results becomes easy. You can actually compare number for number. But as you realize it, it's a very big ask, difficult to get. So the way out is choose your reference lab, whatever it may be. Let that reference lab be running the parameters on whatever platform that they are running. As long as they meet the criteria that they are IQC conscious, EQA conscious, the EQA is valid. As long as you know that the lab is pretty good. We send 20 samples covering the entire range of the clinical values that we expect. We send these 20 samples to the other lab, get their value. Now important over here is you should have your machine data saying that this is the value that came from my analyzer. You should have a printed copy from the reference lab saying that yes, I tested the sample in my lab. The trail should be clear that the sample number which you're sending and the sample number which the reference lab has run should be the same. So when you've done all these trails, get the data, plot an XY scatter, see how your results are in agreement with that of the reference lab. Ideally speaking, okay, the value should be around, uh, the R square value should be more than 0.96. More important is look for this equation. Now there is a cheat, there's a cheat method we can do in this. I employed it in my hospital. It worked very well because we were doing multi, I mean, we're starting up our lab and we have a lot of parameters to do. For me to get 20 samples of parameters which are low volume, like the FSH, LH, because we're not firing all cylinders. For me to get those 20 samples covering the entire range is going to be very difficult. So what I did is I found the reference lab that I'm sending and say, you're doing a lot of FSH. Please pick me up 15 to 20 samples that cover the entire range and send it to me so that I can test it along with their value. The added advantage of this is that I don't have to pay the reference lab any additional test. And the sample that they're sending to me was as such going to be discarded the next day as per their storage policy. So they lost nothing. I gained everything. It worked for me, worth a negotiation. You can also take it. So after you've got the data, you're plotting an XY scatter, you're looking for the R square value and a value of R square of more than 0.96 is supposedly very good. Look for this equation. Why? Because different platforms give different results for the same analyte. We all know that. And this difference is more market when we talk about immunoassays. So for that reason, I mean, if I'm having a Siemens and somebody is running a Bakeman Coulter or somebody is running a Witross, the TSH in my platform, the TSH in that platform may not be the same. So for that reason, this equation becomes very important because I have covered the entire spectrum. If you notice, there is no clustering of data around one point. This is where we need to be very specific that when we choose the data, we should cover up the entire clinical rate. This is glucose. I'm taking samples all the way from 60 to 400. So similarly for each of the tests, you need to be sure that the samples you're sending for comparison cover the entire analytical range. Now, down the line, if I have a QC problem and I've done some correction and I want to go for interlab comparison, the sample I send to the reference lab and the results I get may not be similar, but I know the equation this was the equation that worked for me ab initio when my systems are very good. So now I put the values of the reference lab in this equation and extrapolate what would have been the value if it ran in my system. And those values are comparable. So this becomes a very important document when we do the accuracy studies, a very important document and a very important equation for future inter uh, lab comparisons. If you're fortunate enough to have the same analyzer, same platform, same reagent in another lab, then you really don't require the equation. Otherwise, you still do.
Now, analytical measurement range or linearity, that is, uh, this test is important for us to know what the vendor is claiming. Is it really linear to that extent or not? Okay, that is the easy way, which is, that is the correct way, which is the hard way. And then there's the easy way, uh, which is a simple way. Now, what's the correct way? They again talking about glucose. In glucose, we know that the range of the test is going to be 60 to 400 or 500 milligram samples. So check your runs. You've got some values in the 400. You've got some values in the six, uh, 60s. Take these two samples. The 400 designated as H, the 600 designated as L. So we've got two points. We need three more points in between. So then use this equation. Take four parts of H, that is 400 milligram per deciliter. Take three parts of H and one part of L and mix it up. The designated value of this will be 350 milligrams per deciliter. Take two parts of H and two parts of L and mix it up. The designated value becomes 230. Take one part of H and three parts of L, mix it up. The designated value becomes 145 milligram per deciliter. The equations have been given here. And four parts of L that we started off with, 60 milligram per deciliter. Now we've produced five points starting from 400 to 60 milligram per deciliter. This is the expected value that we should be getting. We run the test in our system and we see what is the observed value. And again, plot the scatter graph. Again, this value of 0.96 is very good. And if you see this data like this, which is senior, we have said that in this entire range that I expect in my clinical performance, this system is very good and the expected and the observed values are correct. So this is the right way to do it. The problem with the current method is if I'm doing a validation verification for one test, it's easy for me to do this. But ab initio, like when I started off my lab and there's this pressure that we have to start biochemistry on SARA test ka verification curlo. So I have the entire chemistry of about 40 parameters and for all of them, if I have to pick up samples and do this, it is a killing task. So what we do in that is take the controls. You have the high control, you have the low control, mix it up in the same proportion. You get all the five points. Now, since this is a control element, uh, all the test parameters are there. You can designate the values for each of the intermediate points the way we discussed it run all the tests. So in one single test, you can validate all your chemistry processes. Uh, Arun sir, sorry to interrupt you. We have yeah. two minutes left to wind up the session. Thank you. Okay, fine. So this is one easy way of doing it, right? The problem with this method is that it really does not, it would not be testing all the parameters to the great extent. So there is a limitation to this. Biological reference interval measurement very important, especially when we talk about immunoassays, because remember that the kits we are using are imported, manufactured, and standardized for a different population. And we are going to extrapolate the data in our situation. So we need to do it. 20 males, 20 females. If you have age specific values, go through that. But the problem that we have over here is most of us always resort to some easy methods and we go to the master health checkup plan. And we'd say that these are my normal patients. That's exactly what we do because these are build tests. So you have your values also in it and it's economical. But when you get outliers, how sure are we that the patients in the master health checkup are actually normal people? They could be diseased people who are just using the master health checkup because it becomes more economical. Point to ponder. Now, when you get an outlier while establishing your biological reference range, what we normally do is replace the red card with an other black card and say that we are verified the uh, biological reference interval. That is something is a question onto your integrity. That's for you to take the call onto it. So your final package, when you do a method verification, should have an SOP a clear definition of what you were trying to do, clear identification of who is going to do, the guts to see the raw data, and accept whatever raw data you get, test your interact your precision, accuracy, linearity, biological reference range. 
tetis troponin, the criteria is clear that for calling a test as an HS troponin, at the 99th percentile of the normal population, we should be having, we should be able to demonstrate a CV of 10%. So pick up the 99th percentile, either you use the manufacturer's claim or you run 100 tests, not possible, but do it 10 times, do it 20 times or 10 times and at least demonstrate that the CV is 10%. Plain simple mathematics, when you work about the number of tests which will be involved in a method verification it comes to about 100 to 120. Okay, so there you have the intelligence to use that if the test is a routine test and an economical test, use 2020 repeats. If the test is expensive, think in terms of 10. If the volume of the test is low, think in terms of five. That is a bit of vagary into it, but as long as you define it and what you're going to do it and follow it, things are okay. Because you're doing verification for yourself and not a fear for an auditor. You're doing this verification process to satisfy your conscience that when you sign this report and when this report translates to a patient management, you're confident that you have done the right thing. Thank you.